Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon for the University of Regina 2023 Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series. Uh, Mel uh, Dr. Melanie Griffith Bryce, Nitsi Kasson, Mitchif Nia, Lac de Prairie, Kayate Oche Nia Egua, La Bruchere, Sagahigan. Um, I'm Dr. Melanie Griffith Bryce. I'm the Gabriel Dumont Research Chair in Metis Michif Education and Associate Professor of Indigenous Education, Language and Literacy and Educational Course Studies in the Faculty of Education here at the University of Regina. Over the next hour, you'll hear from alumna Rosalie Tassani Bursett, a leader, an educator, and an advocate for the preservation of Indigenous languages and culture. Before I introduce Rosalie, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Regina is situated on the territories of the Nehiwak, uh, Anishinaapak, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. The University of Regina is on Treaty 4 lands with a presence of Treaty 6, a presence in Treaty 6, my apologies. The University of Regina uh, Alumni Relations Department is pleased to be able to offer the Alumni Effect Speaker Series virtually. This is my first time hosting a lecture in this series, and I hope that your time with us today inspires you to return for future, ses for future sessions. I'd like to point out that these sessions are being recorded and will be posted on the U of R Alumni website so that you can watch the presentations again or share them with your friends and family. You will see a link to the alumni website in the chat if you'd like to access the video later. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our September speaker in the University of Regina's 2023 Alumni Effect Virtual Speaker Series, Rosalie Tassani Bursath. We're glad you're joining us. Rosalie Tassani Bursath earned her Master of Education from the University of Regina in 2001. She has been a leader in the field of education for 36 years as a teacher, principal, and director of education, and is an advocate for the preservation of Indigenous language and culture. She is a residential school survivor who defied cultural expectations through her education and career path, paving the way for other women in her community and beyond. Today, Rosalie will discuss her experience navigating her own educational journey, as well as her career educating others. Following her discussion, we will have about 15 minutes for question and answer session. As you listen to Rosalie's story, please put your questions in the chat feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. I will share them with Rosalie after our discussion ends and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as time allows. And I will now turn the floor over to Rosalie Tassani Berseth to introduce herself. Um, thank you for the introduction. My name is Rosalie Tassani Verseth, and I'm uh, Denis Sunchene from uh, Hutch Lake First Nations, and I'm, I occupy the Treaty 10 territory. So, first of all, I just want to say, since in John Helias T, Denis Sunchene, John Helias T, the thoughts of all of us, and I'm happy to be speaking in my language as well because that's the work that I have been doing, and it gives me pleasure when I when I speak in my language. Uh, before I start, I want to thank the U of R for the award that was presented to me in 2020, the Professional Achievement Award. Very humbling experience. It, when you get awards as such, it just promotes you to do more. So. Thank you, Rosalie. Uh, we're really excited uh, to have you join us. And my first question is, what inspired you to have a career in education and more specifically in the preservation of Indigenous education? Okay, uh, I'm gonna put, tell you a little story to put things into perspective. In 1964, when I was six, I've given you my age already, um, we lived um, on Wollaston Lake, there was no electricity, no running water. We were half time on the land and, and coming into Wollaston. So Wollaston has been in existence since I, since I was born there. So in mid August, 1964, it was a beautiful day. I can always remember how beautiful it was. As I'm speaking now, I could almost feel the air, uh, the warm air. The lake is just gorgeous, blue. And um, I'm holding my mom and I'm holding my uncle and I'm skipping along and I'm going, yay, I'm going to go to school. This is all in Denny though. I had no clue what school meant. So um, 
So we are on this 185, uh, an airplane. So we get on there and the plane takes off. And uh, I look back in my window and I'm going, something's wrong. The lake is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So it, it's almost like, like a dream, but I'm gonna come back to that dream uh, a little later. Life in the North is beautiful. I was very inquisitive as a young child. I was always asking questions on the land because that's who we are as land, water, people. Beautiful, pristine, uh, the winters. We love winters. There's more winter in, up north than maybe it is down south. However, we did not have wood frame homes, but we lived in a tent. Um, still remember all uh, the love uh, that I experienced from my family, despite the cold, cold weather, minus 45, 50, I was safe, I felt loved and I was warm. So um, at a young age, I started to look around and uh, looked at the land and the people and our way of life because that was my life, right? That, that's all I knew. So residential school had an immense impact on my language and culture and also my emotions. So when I told you I got on the plane, I took off and when I woke up, I was in the four brick walls, totally, I thought it was totally a different world, uh, uh, maybe out in space somewhere. But what I, what I remember was my sister was getting her hair cut and uh, I knew I was next and I was trying to hide, I was crying because um, mom always lovingly combed her hair and it meant a lot to us. Hair means a lot to uh, First Nations people. So, so when that, that haircut, um, was done, I, I just felt severed, severed already because I was distanced from my home community already and also the impact of my language and our culture because we couldn't speak it. Um, and also the inability to cry for many, many years because I received a letter from my, my cousin telling me my aunt had passed away and I started to cry and I was told you can't, you're not, you can't cry, stop it. We'll give you something to cry about. So I just suppressed that for many years. So um, it's just within the last few years that I really started to deal with it. And as a mother, that kind of exhibits a little bit, but I've learned I've learned to express myself. So what really resonated with me was uh, the curriculum. I just wondered why it was not taught in Denny or my culture. It was totally different. So at that young age, I knew then I was going to be a teacher. Um, that I, then I would teach the curriculum that's relevant to, to the students of, of Dene. We teach them in their environment, in their epistemology. Thank you so much uh, for, for sharing that. Um, what challenges did you face in your educational um, oh, sorry, I skipped a question here for you. Sorry, I'll go back one. <laughs> yeah, keep, keep, you, keep both of us on track. Uh, what drew you um, to your area of expertise and what interests you about the field of education? So you, you did mention about um, Dene uh, not being uh, in, in the curriculum. Um, so were, there, were there other things that, that drew you into that work? Yes, for sure. And I, yes, at language and education. Um, so when my two worlds collided, coming from the north and going to the south, um, that's when I realized, you know, this is what really drew me. And I knew at a young age, I'd be a teacher. And uh, I remember a friend asking me at one time who we were studying at the University of Regina. And she said, give me one word that best describes you and your experience at residential school <clears throat> and also in your life as a teacher and thought about it. And I, the word I could, came up with was turmoil. I wasn't quite sure where I sat on the fence, whether I should uh, go into my home. I was treated differently. Uh, and down south, the life down there treated me differently as well. So I sat on this fence and uh, the way society is, you learn to conform to that, to comply to, the environment around you. So that's, I went through a lot of, um, and it was, I was different already. I felt a lot of resentment at one point where I thought, well, I didn't want to be First Nations because it seems to be a bad thing. However, I went through that and eventually um, I just 
you know, very quietly thought, you know, this is who I am. And uh, so even with the language, I, I don't believe any child should be whispered at night not to be heard. So that's when I really decided that I'm going to be working with languages. I'm going to work with First Nations children who speak their language. And, and so the clash of these two cultures really confused me. But at the same time, that's, that's what drew me to my expertise today. And it takes many years to, to work through that. And, and teaching it really inspired me to go forward. So I, uh, out of high school, I went to Random City um, before going to NORTEP. And uh, I, I used my Mavis speaking typing skills from grade 12. I'm so happy I could type. I still use it. I'm a fast typer. So, and then I, when I went back home, just right after that, Random City closed. That's a different story. So I went, I was helping at school at uh, as a TA and the print principal said, you know, you should, you're really good to kids, you should apply for this. And it was an application for NORTEP. So I thought, oh, yay, this is my opportunity. I wanted to be a teacher anyway. So at the time we came out with a standard A. Now I've worked on that through the years. So then I realized that I could uh, go into NORTEP open many doors for me because I realized that I could study about myself because you live in your environment and you think you know it all because you're in that element, right? So I started to learn about indigenous peoples and however, I gravitated more towards the Dene, the history of, of our people and the Hudson Bay and Sam, Samuel Hearn and Petty Toe. I, I say those two names because they've really helped me um, see life in the uh, 1700, 1770, and with Petitot in the 1800s when he came to study the languages. And what they did was uh, Petitot noted down the language, which helps helped me today. And Samuel Hearn, who was very uh, explicitly drew photos and tools of the Dene and how they dressed back then. So that helps me formulate how they dress and how they spoke. So th that I, I just felt. Uh, was such a huge learning curve to even learn about myself. However, uh, Padito described the people and said, you know, they live in dilapidated state. They're poor, but what do you expect in, in, in the 1800s, right? It's just a way of life that's someone's perspective, not ours. However, he really revered the language by saying their language is so divine. So he had studied it. So he kind of contradicted himself. So that really helped me form uh, the, the, the idea, the concept that this is what I really want to do. Um, so that became my passion, which I am studying now at the University of Saskatchewan, then a history, language, and culture. That's my bliss. I tell you, I've learned so much about being Dene. How much more can I learn? But it continues in the linguistics of the language and the history of Dene people. Uh, you, um, uh, you know, it's just uh, fabulous to hear um, your stories about your experiences um, uh, growing up uh, and going to school, uh, the turmoil um, that you faced uh, in learning to conform. Uh, what challenges did you face in your educational and professional journey? I had uh, overcome many challenges. Uh, a lot. First, well, um, I persevered all that because like I said earlier, you can either fall into that negativity, but I've learned at an early age that I don't have to, that I can persevere. So um, I was deprived of my cultural teachings through the curriculum in the South. So the one thing um, that I found was we embrace students who really have the intelligence that they bring to us. And I was faced with a lot of racism as well, not only in the South, but also in my community and never anywhere else that I went, because I, I really think society is that way when someone's a little bit different from the norms and they kind of frown upon it. However, um, you have to kind of comply to the society norms. Because of this racism, I, I really gravitated to help in the uh, teacher induction, teacher orientation, uh, acculturation, because they 
too are coming to a different environment, they feel uncomfortable. They maybe feel like they're exposed to racism as well. So I really wanted them to know about the culture and the language, to be aware of the com community that they work in. So, and I noticed early in my career, this is maybe about the second or third year of my career, the teachers are really struggling to adapt to our, our community because they're from the South, right? They're, uh, I was out of 10 teachers at the beginning, I was the only Denny person. So I really wanted to help them. I really want them to help them adjust and I really wanted them to have a good teaching career. So what, I guess it's what we would call a culture shop now. So what I've done is to, uh, through my teaching, just adapt and enhancing the curriculum a little bit. I really wanted to teach grade five and six. However, as the administrator prevails, I've been an administrator for many years, my principal decided I should teach kindergarten. And I'm going, no, no, I don't want to teach them. They're babies. I, I don't know how to deal with them. <clears throat> However, those were the, the best three years of my life in teaching. I just want to share a little bit of about the kindergarten class and we're doing this unit on fish. And I said, hey, what kind of fish do we have on in Wollaston Lake? And they're just looking at me. This is in English, right? They're just looking at me. Okay. So I switched to Danny. Excuse me, I said, La is when John Tantwe. So she was on a trout, white fish. All the fish came at me. And this is where this is little five year olds. So that really, um, I took it as an opportunity because they have that intelligence already. They're living in their environment. They know all that stuff. So the next morning, um, I always met them at the bus and this little girl comes out and she's pulling a bag. She was a lot smallest one in the crowd. And I said, what do you have there? She said, and she said, so I have white fish for you because I know you like it. So I made a big issue out of that. I had my TA cook the fish, you made bannock, and as teaching goes, you touch, you feel, you taste, and it, they still remember that. This is 30-some years ago. So, um, and again, in uh, 1989, I was working in Northern Lake School Division at the time, and we, we took some students to be engaged out on the land, So, which now they call land-based education, but I started that a long time ago. I don't know um, if it's education when it's a way of life. And that's how, how they were taught. So we went, we flew up north, close to the territories. Uh, this is uh, grade nine students. Flew up north on a twin otter. If any of you know what a twin otter is, it's a beautiful uh, war plane, it's just awesome. Um, we went to many islands, culture camps. So <clears throat> for a week, we, we fished, we hunted, we, we did all the good things on the land. <clears throat> the students were observing all that. So the time came for Friday. I had to split up to uh, the two groups of students, Friday and Saturday. And these are teenagers. And you would think they wanted to go home on a Friday. They were fighting to fly back on Saturday. So I had to split them up. I went with the first group because, only because I had a meeting elsewhere and I had to go Friday. So one student, he was looking out the window as we're flying and I said, are you okay? He said, no, I'm not okay. I said, what, well, tell me about it. He said, as I look down, all this land, it's beautiful, it's pristine. Our people have been there for thousands of years. What were they saying? What were they doing? What were they eating? How were they dressed? And he said, I just, I just long to learn more about that. So for me, and I really took it away, you know, to really impress upon uh, teachers and learners and, and the students themselves, because it's really, they're in their cultural element, right? So as teachers, you have to understand the people you work with. So these are the many things I took pride and talked to the staff about. And part of the U of R, I, I studied uh, to assist teachers and I developed a handbook, how to teach in a Northern isolated community, because I just felt that was so important. Anything that I've done in my life has to do with what I'm doing in my profession. So, and the teachers were part of the research The teachers I've worked with already, and they provided the data. And, and they did say, yes, teaching in the North is truly unique. They gave me lots of good advice. Uh, some are funny, some are uh, straightforward. And they said, uh, some, said, don't eat yellow snow. You never do that. 
you are not the great white hope. Don't come and think that you're going to uh, take care of us because we have already existed for years and years. And be true. Be in the moment and be real with us. If I'm going to be teaching grade four, you must tell me that they're two grades behind. So that's a lot of learning curve. And again, this is all for the improvement of education for the DNA students. <clears throat> and one uh, a very quick, a quick story about a novel that I read to the students in grade five. It was the book of Alive, a plane that crashed in the Himalayas. <clears throat> so before recess in the morning, before lunch, before recess in the afternoon, and before they went home, I'd take five minutes of their time just to read that book. And it took us a while. But as I read, I really interpreted in Denny as well. That's where the strength of both languages came in. So years later, I think about 15 years ago, 20 years ago, one student came up at, at that time, this years ago, he said, you know what? I saw that movie, the book is better. So when you really set them up to truly understand, you know, the strength of the language really works. Thank you. Um, you uh, talked about uh, the mentorship that you provided uh, to other teachers, uh, supporting them in building their capacity to teach in culturally responsive ways. Who were your mentors and what examples did they set for you as you navigated your way past those challenges and moving forward in your career? Mm, okay, well, first and foremost, my parents, my late parents who mom just recently uh, left this world. Um, they taught me to believe in who we were as Dene people, to always honor yourself. Uh, he taught me how to hunt and fish. Um, because in my family, I have uh, seven sisters and three boys. I was one of the older ones. So I got to go on the land with my dad bef between residential schools. So he taught me that about the land, the way of the land, the formation of the land. Formation of the land comes with stories. The immense, immense stories that, told me, that they told me about history, that are legends, are talk uh, told me about stories when we talked to the animals and humans all work together on this earth so for me uh they taught me to dare to dream well in in the southern curriculum we have cinderella so she you know her coach turns into a pumpkin we have stories like that so that's something i would really like to expose to our students where the metaphysical and uh and different characters and different dimensions where they come in and out of our uh, our world and uh, I, I truly honor that at the time when the giant birds were taking care of humans all that so um they they taught me that so that's why i'm still speaking my language and I'm teaching it. And Dr. Linda Goulet, Dr. Keith Goulet, they taught to me that learning is a lot of fun. And I, they, I, I know it's a lot of fun. I make it fun. Uh, work hard and persevere is what they taught me. Dr. David Treason, he has, I think, retired from the U of R a few years ago. Really set high standards for me. He believed in me, and one day I was really upset at him at uh, Northup, and I just felt everybody was getting away with things, and I wasn't. So I said I quit. I slammed the door, <clears throat> and this is in the ranch, and I sat outside in, in the trees, and just thinking about I'm going. What am I going to do now? I just told Doctor Freeze, and I quit, but I don't want to. So I went back, and I knocked on the door. He said, "Come in, Rosalie. I knew you were coming back." And I told him how he made me feel. And he said, you know what? You have a lot of potential. Maybe there's other students don't, um, they they're busy with other things in their lives, but you have so much to offer. So he was there, he coached me when I worked on my master's as well. And then there's Dr. Mike Demjak, uh, his gentle disposition and gentle te teachings. He saw a lot of potential in me as well. Um, just, just awesome. And then I have Dr. Earl Cook, who recently passed away in LaRange, and uh, he taught Native Studies in Northup when I first started university. That, and that's where I learned so much about my people. I was so hooked. The worldview is your language and your social culture, and we are living in a moment as Denny people. So what they had given me, uh, the, the, the doctors, is that 
um, so much an assurance that my language is first and foremost and key that I need to embrace the cultural elements that we live in. Um, and they taught me as well that my language is an asset, not not only for the sole purpose of an asset, but I am learning now that it is really needed now. So I teach First Nations University the, the language, the Daniel language history. So so that began my higher education. So I'm studying Dene history and culture at the moment right now, which will be incorporated into the Dene Sukhine curriculum. So we're going to be thinking about immersion programming and all that. So. Um, th thank you uh, so much for that. How did um, your education and experience working in the education sector help you reach your goals? Okay. Um, well, when, when we're in education, theory comes, right? And the practical part of that comes in when you go into the classroom. But I, I really believe students have really gave me that experience to teach and also the teachers as well, because they are learners to the teachers. And I learned early on that students don't come in and all grade one, same level, they're all gonna learn at the same time. And that's, that's how they taught me about diversity, different styles of, of teaching methods. Um, the teacher also learns alongside the students. And I've, uh, we've always, as an administrator, I, I helped the teachers acknowledge that, that they are the strength and they learn. So not all students are academic. Uh, there's other gifts that they have, and I've learned to, to work with that. And uh, the, the kindergarten that I ta talked to you about earlier, they bring with you cultural knowledge and intelligence, and you work with that. But you must understand the people that you work with to ensure you know good learning happen happens. So, so it is the world view of the students that instills pride, and I see that now. I see our language kind of going a little, but it re it's still really strong up north. I continue to work towards the goals that I set in my life. The goals I set earlier, 35 years ago or so, is different. And it just continues because learning is a continuum, right? You just set more goals, you know, write a book, write a curriculum, do this, do that. Uh, the one thing that I've always um, set three bucket list, three items every year, I go hunting caribou, I pick bears and I go fishing. You know, those are things, those are goals too that I, I, I try to do this year. I, I I didn't do any of that. So I may have to go in the fall to do that. So, and as a scholar, it gives me honor and pleasure to see growth in teacher and student learning. I mean, that's my forte. I, I, I very humbly say, um, I've learned that through the many years. I, I gained that respect and knowledge to help other, other people. So I'm also very active in truth and reconciliation through education and different initiatives. I've, around Prince Albert, they've uh, called me to talk to Catholic Women's League in one community. I think it was Cudworth that I went. Uh, there was about 50 people. I talked about truth and reconciliation at residential school. They had no clue that this happened. And this is today, <laughs> this environment. So. That tells me I have to set more goals and do more work and just creating uh, awareness to everyone. Um, what I would like to see as well for other people to set, not only me setting goals, but to you and everybody in this forum and people in society is to understand how language and culture was lost through all the government policies. So we need we need help to revitalize our languages and uh, you don't necessarily have to be a speaker, but your ideas may be really good. And I just love development of languages too. And I'm, I'm a rebel uh, when you decolonize, when you speak and live your culture, you're, you're a rebel. So we teach that to the young, young people. So, um, I know that's the last question. I just want to go into conclusion that I hope I you've learned something from me and I hope I hope I impacted your life. That, and we're all from different cultures and we have to embrace and showcase our unique cultures that are identities that we have. A friend wrote about me for this award we talked about earlier and it just it just gives me chills. 
uh, someone describing me because I, I I can only do what I do. I can't see him. You, you know that Johari's window, I'm sure you know that uh, other people see my work, but I don't necessarily see. And she said, um, a young girl who took a step out of Wollaston to be different and inspired many, many people. So I'm humbled uh, to have spoken to you and Masi Chosu said, Hey, but this is I know. I'm happy. Thank you. Marcy, th thank you, uh, Rosalie. Uh, we do have a couple minutes. Uh, uh, if there are any of the um, participants here uh, watching have some questions, uh, please put them in the chat. Uh, while uh, we're waiting for that, I do have, I, I have a quick question for you, uh, listening to your uh, wonderful stories. Um, it, at the beginning, you talked about like the pleasure, um, the joy that you find in speaking your your language and being able to speak it in, in many different places. And I'm, I'm curious to how um, do you instill uh, that same joy uh, in other uh, Indigenous language speakers when there's still so much uh, racism and discrimination that makes uh, uh, many people feel uh, ashamed? Uh, of of who they are. I think it's the approach we have as teachers. I I remember um, uh, Dr. Friesen said, "I want you to come into my uh, in my classroom, and this is in Regina. I just want to let you know they have no clue about the North." And he, he said, "You may experience a little bit of racism here." So I walked in, and he introduced me, and all eyes were just on me. No move it movement nothing so i got into my story and i started to talk about the language and i said all of you i want you to say this word and they didn't said hey you're speaking Dene already it's the approach that you have as a teacher as a professor or even as a friend to have people buy into your enthusiasm that language is so 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 very important and i found um, and in all my teaching capacity, uh, even teaching the A100, the class, some of them are not speakers. And I said, you know what? Guaranteed by the end of this class, you're going to be reading, not necessarily comprehending. And they see that already, and they're so excited. So I, I, I just love, I don't know, what's that word? Just inspiring people. Yes. Oh, well, th thank you so much for, um, you know, sharing those stories um, and being so open uh, about your, uh, your journey, the challenges, as well as the many uh, triumphs um, that, that, you, that you have definitely had. Um, there haven't been uh, any questions and, you know, um, I can see that a lot of people are probably just taken, taken aback by uh, all the amazing work that, that you have done. So uh, I, I will uh, wrap things up here and uh, thank everyone for joining us today. And um, thank, thank you so much, Rosalie, for sharing your expertise uh, and your time. Like uh, Marcy, Nanaskoman. Uh, a video of today's uh, alumni effect will be posted soon on the alumni section of uh, the webs of the alumni uh, website. A uh, link to the website can be found in, in the chat. Uh, feel free to share the link with your family and friends. And also don't forget to check the University of Regina website for more information on upcoming events in this series and more. Um, the next um, alumni event will uh, be on October 24th, 2023, and feature kinesiology kine uh, alumna and owner of LG Fitness, Leslie Genoway. Until then, take care and thank you for tuning in.